Hey, what's up guys? It's Hazard. I'm a fighter pilot for the Air Force. Now, today we're gonna to be taking a look at the DCS World Viper Module Simulator. Now, it's billed as one of the most realistic F-16 flight sims out there. I flew the F-16 for six years, so let's take a look. Man, this takes me right back to the F-16. I flew the Block 50 here for three and a half years at Shaw Air Force Base. I'm not gonna talk about avionics, but buttons, switches, gauges, all look spot on. And even the wear and tear on the keys on the ICP is, is accurate. You can see the fur on the seat. So I played a little bit of Jane's USAF and Falcon 4.0 back in the day. And it's amazing how much video games have progressed in 20 years. Now you can see right there, the ICP, that's how you're interfacing with the jet. Now we do have hands-on throttle and stick HOTAS, so buttons that you can interface with the aircraft, but anything more complicated than that, you're gonna be using those buttons right there. So it's like T9 texting, this isn't like an iPad. This was built back in the 70s. So if you wanna input a Z, you have to press the nine button uh, five times. And on the right hand side, you can see the DED. So as you're typing things in, you're going to see it appear on that DED. Uh, so it looks like, uh, you know, old school Atari technology. The F-16 was designed back in the 70s. We've upgraded it quite a bit, but at its core, it's an old school aircraft. All right, so I was at Shaw Air Force Base, so I've flown some of these exact jets that are in the game, so it's pretty cool they made a video game about those aircraft. Now, what you see coming off the jet right here, that is a Maverick missile. So again, old school missile. I've had a chance to launch a few of these, and the thing that stands out is, one, it takes about a second and a half for the rocket motor to ignite. So you're pushing the button, nothing's happening. It's taking a while for the signal to get to the rocket and then coming off your jet. And it's a big missile, so you can see that thing travel out and then impact its target. So uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting experience shooting those things. All right, that's a AIM-9 missile. So AIM-9s were developed back in the 50s. We fly with the great, 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 great grandchild of those AIM-9 alphas, and they are heat-seeking IR missiles, so they're going after infrared. And again, had a chance to shoot a couple of these in training. And the thing you notice, again, that second and a half delay uh, for it to come off the jet. And there's, there's always like time dilation there where you think it's been 10 seconds and nothing's happening and then the thing zips off the rail and you lose it because it's such a small rocket compared to that Maverick. So you lose it and then you hope it impacts the target. Now those are old school, again, Mark 82 bombs. So those were built back in Vietnam, 500 pound warhead, unguided. We've really transferred to precision now. So we use either laser guided bombs or GPS guided bombs or a combination of both. And it really increases our lethality. So a good example would be the Dragon's Jaw Bridge from Vietnam. So it was a strategic bridge in Vietnam and we spent 800 sorties trying to destroy this bridge with dumb bombs and we lost quite a few aircraft over seven years and finally with the advent of laser guided bombs we were able to take it out so that's just an example of how important precision munitions are now old school bombs when i was on the viper we still trained to it and they're a lot of fun to drop so the last time i dropped six like that was in Korea, I was flying with one of the best pilots. I was a young pilot at the time, flying with one of the most experienced, best pilots, Grizz. And we had six Mark 82s to drop each. And instead of the typical thing of going out and dropping them one at a time, Grizz was like, let's do you know one of the most hardcore attacks we can. Let's do 10, 20 pops, drop them all at once and see what happens. So we flew out to Jikdo, which was our training island where we could drop ordnance. And, it was actually a little bit of a pain in the ass because if there are any boats around there, we had to kind of shoo them away 
prior to dropping our weapons. But once we did that, we rolled in 500 feet, 500 plus miles an hour, popped, acquired the target, rolled in, dropped him, was doing my safe escape, turning about five and a half Gs, you know, squeezing into the seat, looking over my shoulder, and I could see all those weapons impacting, detonating at once and turning the uh, island into a cloud of smoke. All right, so right there, gear retraction. Believe it or not, we have a chance of overspeeding the gear if we don't retract it right away as soon as we're taking off. Typically not in an air-to-ground configuration like that, so you can see the targeting pod as well as the two fuel tanks out there. But if you're in a clean jet or an air-to-air -air jet and you're doing an AB afterburner takeoff, then you wanna make sure your gear is being raised quickly. Now, like anything flying fighters, there's a balance. You don't wanna raise your gear too soon because our flaps are tied to our gear. So we don't have a separate switch for our flaps. So as soon as the gear is coming up, our trailing edge flaps retract. And if you are at high altitude or if it's hot, so think Phoenix or the Middle East in the summer, then you can have a chance of settling back down on the runway, which is obviously no bueno without gear. <laughs> All right, A, the graphics on this are just incredible. I feel like I'm back in the Viper watching this, but right there you can see our leading edge flaps. So I just talked about the trailing edge flaps. We also have leading edge flaps, and that allows the aircraft to be a high performer in a dynamic environment. So we want the leading edge flaps to retract when we're flying at high speed because we want the least amount of drag. And then when we're flying low speed, we want the camber of the wing to increase. That increases our drag, but it also increases our lift. You can also see the jet is low energy, low airspeed right there. The reason is you can see the vortices coming off the wing root. Now, when you're flying fast, you're not gonna really get those vortices, of course, environmental dependent, and then you're gonna see them start at the tips of the wings and propagate inward. So I'd say he's flying 250, 300 knots right there. Strafing. Now, I had a chance to strafe a few times in combat, as well as probably hundreds of times in training. F-16 has the M61 Vulcan Cannon, and this is a Gatling gun. It shoots at 6,000 rounds a minute, and we only carry 500 rounds. So math in public with a spool up, spin down, that's about five seconds of gun. So we're really concentrating our firepower. And each of these bullets, 20 millimeter rounds, and they're not like when you go to the shooting range, not just solid bullets, they are high explosive incendiary rounds. So that means that they're little miniature grenades going off. So still an effective weapon, especially for suppression. You can see that was a high aspect pass right there. So BFM, basic fighter maneuvers, also known as dog fighting. You can see the speeds right there. So I would guess they're boat traveling just under the speed of sound. Now I did a video last week on what the speed of sound is, why we use that and how fast it is. It's about 750 miles an hour, give or take, depending on altitude as well as temperature. But when you're going against somebody who's also flying just under the speed of sound, that's a mile every three seconds. So you gotta be thinking quickly to keep up with the decision making, especially for a high speed, high aspect merge, just like that. <laughs>
Wow, that was incredible. I really do feel like I'm back in the Viper flying that. My last flight in it was in 2016. Now I fly the F-35, which is a much more capable aircraft, but not as much of a visceral experience like the Viper. So it really brings me back. I'm amazed at what Eagle Dynamics has been able to do with the DCS World as well as the Viper module. I'm gonna have to get a PC so I can play it. Who out there wants to fight?